Thank you for staying with us. Yobe State, not East Nigeria, is the most devastated by Boko Haram insurgency after Borno State. As such, developmental efforts of the state government is geared towards post-insurgency recovery and resettlement of displaced persons. In his first extensive interview, Governor May Malabuni told Babaji Nikolade Ostoju that his administration has made progress in this regard. Governor Buni also spoke about politicking that ensued during the time, during his time as the caretaker chairman of the ruling All Progressive Congress APC. Here is the exclusive interview with Yubi State Governor B. Malabuni. This is a special interview with the Executive Governor of Yobe State, Honorable May Malabuni. Executive Governor, thank you for all you do for our people, and it's good to see you for the first time in uh, flesh and blood. Thank you. My first question to you is, how has it been governing Yobe State these past four and a half years? Thank you very much. Thanks for having me, and uh, you are most welcome. Uh, well, governing your best state for the past four years uh, is a very, very pleasant experience. And it hasn't been easy, actually. Of course, a state that is recovering from the devastation of the Boko Haram for over a decade, and of course, uh, you know, we have to deploy that multisectoral approach. Multisectoral in the sense that there is no sector that you will ignore because all the sectors require attention. But what we did when I came on board was first to declare a state of emergency on education because the, the Boko Haram devastation has adversely affected our education system and so also the agri sector. We had two, two summits, one on education, one on agriculture. The one on education, uh, after the declaration of state of emergency on education, we invited experts across and then set up a technical committee after the summit where they came up with recommendations, part of which we had to even launch a fund raiser to ensure that uh, we have what we now call the YET Fund, UOB Education Trust Fund. And uh, also on the agriculture, uh, we set up a committee supported by uh, uh, Bill Melinda Gates and Angote Foundation to revitalize agriculture because it is the shortest way of uh, reviving the economy. Uh, like you asked, it is, uh, it is tasking, it's a Herculean task. Like you know, Yobe is second to Borno in terms of devastation. That will actually attest to what we went through. And uh, even Damatru here that we are conducting this interview was under Boko Haram at a point. Uh, before 2015. So you can imagine how and what our people went through. And of course, uh, we are doing our best. And we have done our best for the past four years. It was a pleasant experience serving your people. How are you um, getting our people to pick the pieces of their lives in this era, or in this post insurgency era? Boko Haram at a point was even in control of your local government. Uh, and I was told that even Shekau is from your state. Yeah. Now, we are coming out of insurgency. What steps have you taken to um, resettle our people and um, uh, make them uh, realize that insurgency in the past um, contribute to the development of the state? Like I said, it's a multisectoral approach. And of course, uh, there is no sector that you will ignore because uh, uh, our people are impoverished, traumatized. Of course, the 
decade long insurgency, people were displaced, yeah. some were at the uh, IDP camps and things like that. Of course, we have to come up with uh, deliberate strategies that will actually address some of these problems. First is to secure the state. Without securing the state to ensure that the people are secured, you cannot make any meaningful achievement and you cannot make anything out of what you want to do. For us here in Yobe, security is first line charge. We have to make sure that uh, we, we secure the people for the people to now feel free uh, to forget the past. First, for those who have been out of school as a result of the decade-long insurgency, you have to address the education sector from basic to secondary. And for those who are, uh, who are into their businesses, like farmers, herders, and people like that, you have to also look at the areas where you can support them to also go back to business. Part of the reason why I came up with this idea of building markets, even most of the markets that were closed during the Boko Haram and immediately after the Boko Haram insurgency, we have to reopen the markets. We, we embark on building ultra-modern markets across our major towns, especially Damatru, the state capital, Portiskum, Gashua, Nguru, Gaidam, and Buniadi. People are going about their normal businesses. That is how to rejuvenate the economy. And also, uh, we launched a program that we call Yobe First. Yobe First is a strategy to actually ensure that uh, we have all that it takes to move Yobe forward from within. Especially we have some dormant factories, industries, like uh, the Sahel Aluminium, we have the Yobe flour mills, uh, we have the uh, Woven Sachs Company, we have the, uh, the uh, fertilizer blending plant, we have uh, uh, pre-stress uh, pre poles, industry, and others. So part of the reason why we have to uh, bring them back to life is to ensure that uh, uh, most of these things that we want are here, are local. We have to create jobs. Of course, the multiplier effect of all these things is going re revolving around the state. And like the aluminum, uh, aluminum, uh, Sahel aluminum that I mentioned, most of the buildings, most of the rehabilitations, uh, they supply the roofing needs of the buildings. When we embark on construction of 3,000 housing estate across the state, you know, we didn't go out looking for uh, aluminum roofing sheets elsewhere. They were locally met here in Yobe, and our people are the ones that are there providing the labor and what have you. And of course, the contractors patronize Sahel Aluminium as, this is just an example of uh, how we are able to revive some of these dormant uh, industries to life, to ensure that we create jobs and of course, for the economy to revolve within the state. Yobe, like you know, is an agrarian state and of course, uh, uh, we have the land and we have the people who are determined and are into agribusiness. So we are encouraging because we have to procure farm, uh, farming implements and uh, encourage them by uh, subsidizing fertilizers for them to be able to uh, meet the needs for their uh, farming. Also, empowerment strategy. That is the reason why we even created the Ministry for Wealth Creation and employment generation. So, you see, it is a deliberate strategy of uh, addressing the problem. The frontline local governments, I mean from Unisari to Gulani, that's cutting across seven local governments, and of course, Potiskum and Fika. Um, most of the people, even Potiskum Township was at a point deserted. So you have to resettle these people properly by providing them with the basic amenities like hospitals, schools, water, roads and drainages, 
for the place to be lively. And above all, you have to secure the environment, like I said. Today, we have substantially addressed the educational problem that, is, uh, that, is, that has been our major problem, uh, especially at the basic and the secondary education, complementing the Yobit Education Trust Fund that we, we establish. And also, we are in the process of establishing teacher training center. Of course, you can imagine uh, all these years, most of the teachers, some have been killed, some have retired, some have, you know. So we have to even employ more teachers, for which we, are, we have to employ over 4,000 teachers, in addition to training and retraining of those teachers that can be retrained. And those that cannot, be, cannot even be, re be trained, we have to deploy them to other sectors where they can also contribute. Not forgetting that we have other higher institutions that we have to work on, like the Obey State University, the uh, School of Nursing and Midwifery, uh, College of Education, uh, State Polytechnic here, to ensure that uh, the secondary education that we are working on can now feed the higher institutions with uh, uh, qualitative students. Many Nigerians are complaining that governors are not doing enough in this area. You talked about your state, but the report we are getting is that these palliatives are not going around as some governors are really not doing enough. Have few people sat down as governors to try and see how this can be streamlined so that the pains that our people are going through can be eased and people do not have to depend fully on the federal government. Yeah, we have, at a point when the subsidy was removed, the Nigeria Governors Forum deliberated and uh, come up with some far-reaching decisions. You know, every state has its own peculiarity. And of course, for instance, some fields, they have to buy vehicles to distribute so that to subsidize the cost of transportation or to ease the uh, difficulties in transportation. We deliberately ensure that, look, we have to fix all the roads to ensure that all our local governments are connected and are motorable. So that is why we are working on the roads to ensure that we have good roads across, good road networks across the state. Road is very important because lack of roads most often contributes to insecurity because it aggravates insecurity. That is what some of the criminals are exploiting because bad roads actually aggravates insecurity to me. So that is why we have uh, close to 200 kilometer roads construction now. We are almost finishing most. So we are doing our best. I get the point that you are making, but the concern for most Nigerians is that the palliatives are not going around. That is the, the point that I'm making, that how do governors come together to ensure that people are rich? There was a video of a man who said they gave uh, just one small bag of rice to the community. Maybe it's exaggerated, I wouldn't know. But the, the concern out there is that the most vulnerable of our people those who need these bags of rice and other uh, food items the most, it's not reaching them. Some governors are doing well, some are not doing well in that area. That is the point uh, that I'm making. How do you people, maybe through peer review, you know, talk to one another and get this to improve? A peculiarity brings about prioritization. It is a matter of priority it's a matter of peculiarity because, like I said, out of the 36 states, you will agree with me that after Borno, it is Yobe in terms of devastation, then Adamawa State. The three Bay states are the worst affected states when it comes to devastation of Boko Haram. And this insurgency, when we are talking of insurgency, some will also bring about some insurgencies in other places, comparing it to it to the, to that of Boko Haram. You know the Boko Haram insurgency, what makes it different and what makes it difficult, what makes it most monstrous is because they are looking for how to die. 
while the race are looking for money to survive and enjoy. So you can now see the difference. Somebody who is looking for how to die to go to heaven is different from somebody who is looking for, he will even go and kidnap for ransom to go and look for money and then go and enjoy. So you can now see the difference. Those, the other ones, they don't even want to die. They are afraid to die, but these ones, they are looking for who to kill and or to die with. So you can now see the difference. You know, we are facing a very serious, monstrous, heinous of the insurgency. So you can, you can imagine, you can, you can look at the two side by side and understand where I'm coming from. So the Boko Haram insurgency that people will come to a mosque as a good Muslim, fully loaded with explosives, in the midst of prayer, they will detonate and everybody in the mosque will die. The mosque will collapse. So you can now see the difference between somebody who will go and hide in the bush, kidnap somebody and look for ransom, only for him to go back to a city and build house live happily with his family. That has adversely affected our infrastructure over the, year, over the years. We are rebuilding afresh. I have to make the people of, of all these affected communities to feel the impact of governance. Because how will they feel the impact of governance? First, we have to provide roads, electricity, hospitals, schools, water. These are very serious things that we have to actually work on to ensure that our people are fully resettled with dignity as human beings. You know, you cannot just settle people in their communities without dignity as human beings, yes. lacking in all amenities. So that is what we are fighting. So it is different from people who are having all these things intact. You know, you cannot apply a uh, temporary solution to a permanent problem. To me, I, also, I always want to apply permanent solution to a permanent problem. You see, we have to address it holistically without looking at the, situ the current situation. We have to take from what happened, what is happening, and what we are foreseeing. So we have to work along that line. The current president and commander in chief president, Bola Metinubu, has taken the bull by the horn to say, oh, I have withdrawn subsidy. Okay, it is left for Nigerians, irrespective of who you are, where you are, or your political party. Let us copy from the advanced democracies. Look at America, for instance. When it affects America, the Democrats and the Republicans will come together and address the problem. So it is the stability of a ruling party is the stability of any given country. You see, once a party is in power, you have to support the party to succeed, not because you belong to the party, but for your country to succeed. Because there has to be Nigeria first yes. before any other person. So it is not that you, you should be secondary. Primarily, you have to ensure that, yeah, your country is working. We are, most of us are traveling. We are seeing the developed countries and the developing countries, how they are doing, how the system is working. But immediately when we come back to Nigeria, we start behaving differently as if we are from different planets. I was going to ask you, Your Excellency, about places like Gaidam, Babangida, where we still have pockets of Boko Haram attacks. You know, the other day they killed so many people, they attacked the village. What is being done to secure our people in, in those areas so that they don't go and become the IDPs in Niger again? I had a meeting with Mr. President. I went and briefed him after the incident. And I have told him the closure of the border between Niger and Nigeria. Of course, as uh, there is this illicit transaction uh, going on uh, along the borders. So is the transborder crime that, of course, the Boko Harams are now capitalizing on to infiltrate. Of course, they are infiltrating. You know, Boko Haram is not about Nigeria. It involves Nigeria, Niger, Chad, and some other Sahelian count, uh, countries. So it is not about, you know, if you mistake Boko Haram for something in Borno or Yobe, you are mistaken. Because you, maybe you know next to nothing about Boko Haram. So all these Sahelian countries, from Mali, Burkina Faso, uh, up, to, up to Niger, Nigeria, Chad, Cameroon, 
we are all battling with this Boko Haram. The situation in Niger has actually created an illicit transborder transaction. What kind of transaction? Like smuggling, this smuggling cut across whatever it is because it could be of food, it could be of drugs, it could be of weapons, it could be of so many things. Hmm. So of course, that transborder crime has increased. So of course, the infiltration sets in. So they infiltrated, of course, the community you mentioned of around Gaidam, it's a border community between Niger and Nigeria. A Ribayobe that passed through up to the Lake Chad uh, Basin. They are habitating around Niger, Nigeria border. So once the border is closed, of course, they will try to look for so many ways, including even those you think they are good people. But that, smog, that illicit transaction, encourages people into doing so many things. So that was how they infiltrated and started hibernating around that area. But the president is on top of it. And I've told him our military, especially the, 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 the military and the air, are doing their best actually to ensure that they don't allow them to uh, establish any camp around that area. So that I'm pretty sure uh, and I had a meeting with the chief of air staff who is also doing his best. The killings that happened recently around the Niger-Nigeria border, which of course is part of the local government, it's as a result of this uh, sort of uh, uh, collateral, let me put it, collateral damage, because the good Samaritans there will pass information, of course, and of course the military will act, they acted, and when they acted, they came for vengeance. The Air Force and then the military are putting heads together to actually address uh, some of these challenges that uh, we are facing. Even the place they attacked is far from Gaidam. It's a, a border community. Yes. Yes, so where the Boko Haram happened to infiltrate. Even Gaidam, they've attacked Gaidam in the past that our people had to run away. Gaidam is a border town. Is a major town between Nigeria and Nigeria. And of course, uh, you know, you cannot, there is this trans border trade, legitimate one our people are into between uh, Niger and Nigeria, of course, before the closure of the border. Of course, Gedem is a very big town. Gedem is a very huge market when it comes to business. So the attack Gedem, of course, that has been addressed. But the recent one that you mentioned it was as a result of infiltration uh, arising from the closure of border between Nigeria and Niger. And of course, like I said, I was once with the uh, Controller General of the Coston and I briefed him, which of course he has assured us of taking some measures to ensure that they arrest the situation. I've discussed that with the and the LDA commandant here in Yobe because the illicit drugs, drugs business, yes. which of course is it's foiling, the is, behind, is foiling the insurgency and other crimes. So also it's a very serious issue that of course they are also working on it. So it is not something for the media, but I have, we have made uh, adequate arrangement to actually address the situation. But actually the transborder uh, crime as a, as a result of closure of the border is actually uh, uh, pushing some of them into uh, infiltrating into Nigeria illegally and then perpetrate crime. You rebuilt the palace of the uh, Emir yeah, there, yeah. Um, but he has not returned. Yeah, we are... is, it, is, is the security situation still um, uh, dicey to the point that not dicey at, at all, all. Mm. not dicey at all just that you know the construction we are finished with the first one that is the frontage yes. so the inner part of the palace yes. is yet to be completed where the emir will now properly go back and settle with his family so we are working on that and soon will be completed we have constructed township roads and drainages. We have linked them with the national grid. There is electricity there. There is general hospital, which we upgraded to specialist hospital, fully equipped now. 
and we have uh, we have constructed mega school we have constructed estates housing estates we have constructed the market that was born down so we have all the amenities that is needed for people to resettle properly is provided in Buniadi for, for people to uh, to live and go about their normal businesses especially the Friday market of Buniadi is booming as usual so uh, for us Buniadi is secured because we have what it takes to secure it because apart from even the conventional uh, uh, military agencies we have the vigilante who we are paying they are doing their best also so uh, Buniadi is okay and uh, like I said not only Buniadi from Gulani to Unisari these are the frontline local governments there are seven they are all now secured for people to settle and go about their normal businesses yes it is expensive the security aspect of it is best it's very expensive it's something that the eye cannot see but we are doing our best to live up to our responsibility as a government let's go to the modern schools the mega schools that you constructed i visited uh, some of the mega schools in Portiscum and geshua uh, here in damaturu and the students are happy. I spoke with students, I spoke with teachers, but they are saying that you need to build more of these schools because people are leaving um, the conventional schools. They all want to be in the um, modern uh, mega schools, especially in Porti School. That was what they were telling me that look, we want more and more people are coming. What do you have plans to build more of those mega schools? Yes, uh, I'm happy that you went there, you interviewed students, you interviewed teachers and parents, and they have seen the modest uh, effort we have made there to ensure that we uh, at least address the problem. Because when we came on board, of course, most of the schools in Porto School especially, mm -hmm. Well, the stretch because you find about 300 pupils in one class. But today, I'm happy to tell you that maximum you will find in a class is 60, maximum. So that we are doing. And by the grace of God, we are trying to do more to ensure that we decongest the schools. We have so far built 14 mega schools across the state. Yes. And in Portiscum alone, we build three mega schools. You see, when you are talking of education, people think it is only about the infrastructure, that is the classroom. No, mm -hmm. it is the intellectual content of the classroom. Yes. That is the reason why we employed over 4,000 teachers that can teach. But they're asking for more now. That's yes, of course, talking. it is a continuous thing. You know, you cannot address the problem. We, 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 never, to, we never told anybody that, yeah, we are going to stop employing teachers. We haven't said that. We will keep employing more teachers. I'm just telling you that in the four years of our administration, we are yes. able to employ four, over 4,000 teachers who can teach. So that is to improve the intellectual uh, 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 quality mm. of, the, of the schools. It is yes. not about the infrastructure alone. Now we are, we are trying to establish teacher training center in each of the three uh, senatorial districts to ensure that uh, even our teachers can be trained, they, have, they should have you, where to be. Let me take you to health now. You have a big plan for primary health centers. Bring us up to speed with what you have done in that regard. When we came on board, you know, I now promised I will establish one functional primary health care center in each of the 178 electoral wards. We have so far established 140. Hmm. Out of 178? Out of 178. We have already completed 140. We have this uh, nursing school and the midwifery that is feeding hmm. all these uh, primary health centers with the, with the required qualified uh, uh, nurses and the midwives to actually, and especially as a deliberate policy, we said from each of these wards we have to have students 
who will now be trained at the, uh, the School of Nursing and Midwifery to go and man the, uh, the primary health center. So this is a uh, policy that is working so far, and we are determined to finish the remaining ones. With the Yobe State University, uh, the College of Medical Sciences, of course, we have gotten accreditation uh, where our students will soon uh, graduate as doctors. In addition to that, you know, when I came on board, we sponsored uh, 233 students to India mm -hmm. just to study medicine and engineering. So some have completed, some will complete this year. So uh, these are things that we are doing deliberately actually to fill the gap. Here in Yobe State, the public health institutions, dialysis is free, and our women too um, can also have cesarean section for free. The question that readily comes to mind is, is this sustainable because it costs a lot of money to do dialysis uh, on a weekly basis elsewhere. Is, is it possible for your administration to continue to provide these health services for free? Uh, so far, for the first four years that we started, we have never been found wanting and we have never stopped. And we hope we will not stop. Mm -hmm. And that uh, the cesarean session and uh, the dialysis is free, like you said, and also free medical care for accident victims wherever you are from. It's not irrespective of your state or country. Mm -hmm. uh, that is free as human being. And uh, also so many things. I'm happy that you have visited the teaching hospital and the maternal child care yes. center that we built the biggest in the country. Now our teaching hospital cumulatively is over 700 bed space. It is very difficult, but with blocking the leakages and ensuring that judiciously resources are used to ensure that we keep the, uh, the temple, we are, we are hopeful. And uh, one thing we are trying to do is we want the federal government actually to take over the teaching hospital because it is very huge. Of course, yes. uh, looking at the meager resources coming from the federation account. This is why you have uh, best medical attention that you want. And, you, uh, and as I am talking to you, many people are, are being referred from other states to Yobe State, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to certain uh, medical attention, but also the development partners that have been helping us throughout. We are also in touch and working with them to see where they can intervene. But the most important thing is now that we have the structure, we have the e equipment, and we have the we have enough manpower. So now we are talking of sustainability. So that yes. is very essential. So yes. sustainability is a question of idea. Idea is about bringing, developing a concept on how to work to ensure that you sustain it as a tradition. We have already taken it as, as, as a duty to ensure that our citizens access free dialysis. So uh, this is what we are going to pay monthly. This is something doable. Okay. It is something doable. And in addition points. to that, you know the problem of this kidney issue. That's why. Recently, we have to travel out to, 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 to Creek Institute, to uh, York University and places like that because they helped us in establishing uh, 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 a laboratory research center in Yobe State yes. University. We discussed these uh, kidney issues with them because of this rampant kidney diseases in the state. I want us to now talk about politics. Okay. Um, that's my yes, the APC uh, decided to make you its interim chairman at some point. Uh, caretaker and extraordinary convention planning, convention planning uh, committee. Yes, how did they settle for you? What uh, was going through their minds when they felt okay? It is Governor Malabune that who lead the party at such a critical time? Well, thank you for, very much for this question. That committee you mentioned, the caretaker and extra, 
Extraordinary Convention Planning Committee. I wasn't there when they mooted the idea. Mm -hmm. I was here. I have already handed over as National Secretary. I have settled down for my duty as Governor of Yobe State. Then suddenly, one, I received a call from the villa. That, and then the former president said, this is what we want you to do. Mm. Uh, this party is in crisis already. Mm. So there is this disaffection, which of course has to be addressed now. Otherwise, we will end up having problems in our hands. And I said, what do I tell my people? Well, just for some few period, few moments, I said, okay. I accepted to serve. And uh, you know, uh, political party is all about human management. Why you have competing and conflicting interests to manage. It is not about your personal interest or serving somebody's interest. It is about bringing people together and give them sense of belonging. That is the reason why the day, the day I took over, I said, if you don't manage crisis, crisis will manage you. And of course, the beauty of democracy is to allow the democracy itself to, to breathe. Let it breathe. Don't suffocate it. Let it breathe. Like I said earlier in our discussion, I told you, uh, the, the stability, unity, and progress of a ruling party amounts to stability, unity, and progress of the, the country. Because you need people to come together to give ideas, to contribute the quota, so that the country will now develop. It is now about Nigeria. Even if you hate APC, for the fact that APC is in power, if you love Nigeria, you have to support APC to succeed. So that has been my concept, and that has been, you know, it is not about being brash, it's not about being harsh, it's not about coercing people, it's not about creating fear. You see, this, there is this disadvantage of playing politics of fear. You don't create fear in the minds of people for you to think you will conquer them. It's not about conquest. It's about persuasion, it's about bringing people together, give them sense of belonging, create understanding and the reasons why they need to help you to succeed. Some in the process of engagement, they will even join your party. Yes. So it is not by coercing, it's not by force. You can't force people into doing something. You encourage them, persuade them, let them know that yes, there has to be Nigeria first before any other person. Do you, do you regret accepting to serve in that capacity? I don't, I don't. I don't. You know why I asked the question? No. At the point you were saying that you wanted to sit tight, that you were not interested in uh, surrendering the position for proper relation to take. You know, sometimes when it reaches its crescendo, people will lose their minds. At a point, some of those people who are criticizing me of wanting to sit tight do forget that I am a sitting governor. Sometimes even my colleagues used to forget that I am their colleague. They would say, you chairman. I said, no, I'm your colleague now. <laughs> oh, sorry. So you see, you can now imagine where they are coming from. Ambition sometimes blinds people into thinking that, look, this man is planning for this, this man is planning for that. I was not part of those who even started the process of constituting this uh, caretaker and extraordinary convention planning. I was not part of it. Just like I said, I have not printed a poster in 2014 to contest for the national secretaryship. I have not discussed with the president or any other person to say, look, I want you to give me this party or appoint me as chairman of the caretaker at extraordinary convention planning committee. I have never. They said, look, maybe they saw in me somebody who can now accept and tolerate. Because, of course, for you to run a system, an institution like a political party, you have to be extremely tolerant. Abuses castigations, smearing, name calling, so you name it. You have to be extremely tolerant, extremely patient. You have to demonstrate that 
not only to pretend, but to demonstrate that physically for people to see. Somebody will abuse you and shake him and ginger him because your focus is on how to rebuild the party. So that was how we succeeded in rebuilding the party, bringing in three sitting governors from the PDP. You see, the PDP, don't forget, Babaji, they, you, are, they, you, are, you, are, you, are, you are a guru when it comes to the political history of this country. You know that in 1999, when the pressure was so much on the military to go back to barracks after the annulment of the June 12th, they registered only three parties. AD, APP, and PDP, which at the end of the day, only AD, APP ticket, AD, APP ticket and PDP contested. Atiku, uh, Obasanjo, then Olupalae, Shinkapi ticket. You will agree with me that it was a common sense revolution that brought people together, people like General Muhammad Buhari and President Bola Metinubu together to ensure that let us come together and send this PDP packing. Otherwise, we will have no country to call our own. Do you feel betrayed by some of your colleagues? Because some of these name calling, some of these accusations that you want to sit tight, me Mala does not want to go, actually came from your colleagues. Do you feel betrayed? I don't feel betrayed that much because it's politics. If somebody is interested in something, for instance, if somebody is interested in becoming a president and you, he don't seem to see you supporting him, and whatever name he's calling you is legitimate because you are maybe standing between his ambition and what he wants to achieve. So I don't feel betrayed by anybody because uh, to me, when you have a sitting president of your party, your loyalty is first to him. I don't know how to share loyalty, honestly. I may be wrong. You can call me any name. You can call me Stooge. You may even misinterpret it to mean a low level of awareness. I don't care. But what I know is I don't know how to share loyalty. If I'm loyal to you, I'm loyal to you. Okay, we have President Buhari then as president and leader of the party. My loyalty was first to him. Then now we have President Bola Metunubu, President and Commander-in-Chief of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, and our leader of the party. My loyalty first is to him and to no any other person. So you see, there is this difference between people who think they can divide their loyalties between their ambition and the principal. To me, I put the principal come first. So you see, as a party, if you think I, you can be a chairman or you can lead a party and still have different, loyal, different place to submit your loyalty to or to your loyalty to yourself first, that is pursuing your own interest first before your loyalty to the president, then you are wrong. Because the president is the president and president is the father of the country at any time. So that is how it is. So you see, as a political party, we have to come together, rally around the president, whatever the president thinks, then if he is wrong, we have to tell him. I'm happy how that convention ended because former President Buhari, at, during the convention, did not interfere. Yes. So what else do you want? He said we are all APC. This merger succeeded because of the commitment of the two of them. They have all demonstrated uncommon commitment and patriotism to, for Nigeria, especially General Mahmoud Buhari and President Bola Ahmed Tinubu, because they brought this idea of merger, tirelessly worked for it. At a point, you don't dare to, to confront a sitting president, but they came together, ensured that the merger succeeds, and it succeeded. So any other thing to me is secondary. And of course, I don't blame anybody at half. I hold no grudge against anybody for calling me any name. For, they, nobody could have called me any name if I didn't become the caretaker chairman. After all, if I am just a governor of my state, none of my colleagues or nobody will call me any name or will try to smear my image. Or, but it, because once you are on the path of truth, the truth will always vindicate you.
That was what happened and, and ended, um, I ended up well. Because at a point, some group think they can just even sack me and then they will just, uh, as, as non-entity, with all the contributions I made to the party, especially for being national secretary of the party from 2014 to 2018. And from 2018, I, re I got re-elected and up to 2019 when I became governor. You can now see with all the contributions, many of those you are now thinking someone smeared me, calling me names, most of them I signed their nomination. I nominated them. I mean, you know, the national chairman and the secretary are the two nominees to nominate. Without me, the nomination would have been invalid for anybody or any other person that won election from 2015 to 2019. I nominated you, but you call me name. That doesn't matter because it is another chapter. So it is, when you are pursuing something, it is not a pro difficult thing to say, oh, I've forgotten that one. Now I'm pursuing this. It's, it is normal with human nature. So that's why I said it is about human management. So when you are managing human beings, you have to be extremely tolerant. You have to persevere, you have to show capacity. Don't even pretend, display capacity. Because you have to display that uncommon capacity for you to serve. Some people will send group just to smear your name. Oh, why will they smear my name? If you now start shivering, that's, how, that's what they want. They want you to fumble and fail. So I refuse to give in. So that is how it is. Had it been at that point, when I became the national uh, caretaker chairman, this party disintegrated. What would have been the head of the party today? So you see, it is about keeping the party together. Whoever that contributed in keeping the party together should be celebrated, should be encouraged, should be regarded as somebody who has actually sacrificed his time and energy to ensure that this, the, the party remains one. So I'm not against, I, have, I hold no grudge against anybody for anything because it was the, a democracy at play. So you don't suffocate democracy. That's why I say let them say whatever they want to say. It is just like that. You see, in democracy, the, the majority will always have their way, but the minority, minority too must have their say. So it is, it is, but you know, let me tell you, Babajide, let me tell you this. You see, in democracy, to allow minority to decide for the majority will always subject the majority to the rule of few. And that will be repugnant to the basic democratic principle. That cannot work. So whenever, whatever you are doing, those silent people, members of the party, those we registered, over, one, over, over 47 uh, 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 million, if not because of how the party was restructured, we brought three governors, even from the southeast, we brought Governor Umahi, from the south-south, we brought Governor Ayade, from the northwest, we brought Governor Matawali. You know, how do you think this currency design wouldn't have worked against the party to see to its defeat? This is my last question. Did you at any point have some fears that the APC will not win the presidential election, even though the crisis of that? No, my fear was triggered by the currency redesign, actually. Because that currency redesign, I don't know, the timing was wrong because uh, many of our members were the victims, especially up not here, especially where you have cash economy. When APC vehicles are passing, people at uh, the uh, ATM uh, machines will now be abusing the vehicles. The, you will see them physically, some are even throwing stones. It was a very serious situation. Even the members cannot travel from their communities to even their polling units to come and cast their votes because there was no cash. So how do you travel? You call it cashless election. And you ex that was experimented in 2023. That currency redesign actually, actually, that was my only fear. Otherwise, I know the party was accepted nationally because even in the South South, why we have Governor Ayade as a governor there. In the southeast, we have two governors. 
we have Governor Hope Uzo Dima of Imo State, and we have Governor uh, Umahi of Ebo State. We have representation cutting across all the six geopolitical zones. And of course, in politics, it's a reality. You have region, you have religion, you have tribe, you have all this. Everybody is represented in the party. So it is a question of how to galvanize all this followership and the, 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 the membership to victory. The currency redesign actually succeeded in creating problem for the membership and for the leadership. Because even the leaders, if you ask them, they don't know why. And the membership were crying. What did we do wrong that you are now depriving us? You know, APC is a national party already. It's institutionalized already. So, would, of course, you now have a president who is a veteran who is who struggled even against the military in those days who was in the forefront of the nadeco struggle to ensure that democracy uh, is restored and today he's the president so he knows all the workings so he knows people across the country and of course he has sacrificed a lot for democracy and we hope of course uh apc will outlive all of us with all its strengths just that we have to also bring about so many things that will carry the youths and the women and all the vulnerable along. The party is not, uh, it's not a progressive party anymore. That uh, if care is not taken by 2027, 20, they will collect 250,000 for presidential form. Of course you can't stop people from insinuating and of course uh, things like that. But you know, uh, it's still a progressive party because that has been the concept and it's still the concept. Just refer the person to our manifesto and how we are doing things. APC has played a significant role in ensuring that this country remains a country. You see, there is this consensus, this elite consensus, maybe they think it is the APC that is failing. It is not APC. All the candidates that campaigned during these 2023 elections, they all campaigned uh, on removal of subsidy. Yes. So why all of a sudden when somebody who now came and took the bull by the one to say, oh, from the day, from day one I have removed, subsidy is gone and gone forever. And you are now saying, oh, ah, no, 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 this is APC problem. It's not APC problem, it's Nigeria's problem. It is for all Nigerians to come together sit down and assist in seeing to it that Nigeria succeeds. Once Nigeria succeeds, we have all succeeded. So it is not about one person or one party or this. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you too. Thank you. You are most welcome. Thank you for the work you do for our people. Thank you so much. I mean, thank you, thank you, thank you.